You ever talk to other people who share an interest or hobby with you about like a really specific thing and it turns out to be relatable and they immediately get exactly what you're saying and there's just like great moment of shared understanding? I thought I'd make a list of those, but for artists, the digital artist canon event timeline. Like those things that most if not all digital artists went through at some stage of their journey no matter what kind of digital artist they were or around what time they started. And yeah, there will probably be exceptions to this and if there are then um, well shoot, I'm sorry about that. Drawing on your phone. Some of y'all really talented, crazy people never got over this one. It's like when you suddenly make that realization that, oh my god, I want to do digital art, not this lame traditional crap, or at least not only this lame traditional crap, and then you realize that higher-end art tablets are kind of expensive, and you don't know for sure if you can afford something like that. So you want to test out the hobby for free first. Or if you're a kid, you know your parents would never buy you something like that, but you had a better shot if you showed them that you were interested in it first. Which is A-plus parenting, by the way. I feel like we all kind of know the experience of downloading Ibis Paint X for the first time and painstakingly trying to draw something that doesn't look terrible, but it always kind of does for the first time, or maybe the first 10 times really, because moving from drawing with a fine point pencil on paper to a completely different texture with your fat ass f***ing finger really isn't easy. I always admired those like phone artists and animators who like grew up accustomed to drawing that way and eventually became like experts at it because oh my gosh, how? How do you do that? Kind of ties in with the last one, but if you eventually realize that you really don't like drawing on a phone, but you do really like drawing, and you do really like drawing digitally, that's when the quest for an art tablet begins. When you start doing research and watching all those videos of other artists you like doing reviews of tablets, where you start asking around art communities to see what brands people seem to prefer, when you're working up the courage to ask your parents for one for your birthday or for Christmas. There's so many factors to consider when you're getting an art tablet, like the levers of pressure sensitivity it has, whether it has a display or not, whether or not it's portable or easy to set up. And the price ranges are crazy because some of them are like wicked intimidatingly high and then others are like deceivingly low. Like why is that cheaper than a t-shirt, something's up type of low. <laughs> so you ideally do eventually get that tablet you've been waiting for, or maybe you were like me and you realize that you enjoy drawing on an iPad significantly better because you like not having to think about more than one monitor because of your pea brain, and you like being able to carry it around without worrying about any plugs or cables or worrying about whether it'll fit in your luggage or whatever. I don't know, that's just me. Just instantly like drawing on an iPad a hell of a lot more than a tablet. This is more specific, but something that I and a lot of people did was drawing one pupil as like an X in place of an actual, well, normal looking eye. And I did this for two reasons. One, it was edgy and cool and ooh, look, my character is different and not like other characters, look at me being all unique. And two, because I didn't like drawing the second eye. Like, I'd do that thing where my eye style was a heck of a lot more complex than the rest of my art style because I spent way too much time adding all kinds of shinies and stuff and not enough time drawing anything else. And when I finally finished one eye, I really wasn't skilled enough to replicate it again. And if I tried to copy and paste it, usually I was drawing characters at an angle, so I didn't know how to rescale or reshape it properly, and the eye would always be flipped. So the character would look derpy, and I'd have to erase the pupil and draw it again. And I'd always have the same issue. So instead of drawing a second pupil, I just made it an X instead. Yeah. Did anyone else do that? I've seen it before, but I don't know just how relatable this is. Felt like including it anyways though, since like I said, I for sure have seen this before, so at least a few people out there can relate to it. Stabilizer dependency. Something someone in my Discord server pointed out was like that phase where you just turned the stabilizer as high as it could go because you had shaky hands, and you didn't realize yet that it's not about how shaky your hands are, and it's just about the confidence in your strokes. And if you draw a stroke slowly and painstakingly, then it just will come out wobbly whether your hands are shaky or not. And take it from me, someone with really baseline shaky hands because of nutritional deficiencies, who manages to draw without the stabilizer turned up to max. Well, some of my brushes have like a 12% stabilizer or something. Shut up about it, okay? But in all honesty, it's perfectly fine to use stabilizers. They're a tool that comes with your art program, so if they do make you happier with your art, then use them. It's just when it gets to the point where the stabilizer is higher than you actually personally need it to be, and it's evident in your line art because you have weird line weights and edges because of what your program did for you automatically, and you're like fighting with your stabilizer rather than using it to help you, and you're just in that phase where you feel like you're obligated to have it on because you don't trust yourself to do lines without it, so uh... <laughs> 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 
and also along with that, circle tool addiction. Ah, yes, our favorite. When you discovered the circle tool and used it for everything. And for some people, including myself, not just the head. For literally anything that was relatively round. And listen, the circle tool is a part of your program as well as the stabilizer, and it's a tool provided for you to use. If it helps you, then use it. I use the circle tool on my sketches to sketch around. I also know many artists who have kind of worked the circle tool into their art style, and it actually looks really cool. This is more so talking about that phase where you use the circle tool again, like with the stabilizer, when you didn't have to, or in places you didn't have to, when the circle tool was kind of just hindering you because you were using it to get around drawing rounded edges organically. Art tutorial addiction. I feel like this is kind of something that comes and goes with most people, or at least it does with me. And I'm going to project it onto you, whether it's true or not, because... Yeah. But, like, it's not a one-time thing. It's more of, like, every now and then you feel like consuming a ridiculous amount of art tutorials, and then you realize you aren't really learning anything from most of them. So you go back to independent study, and it happens again later, where you just fall back into that cycle. Oh my god. And there's nothing wrong with art tutorials necessarily. Nothing is wrong with most of them at least. A lot of TikTok ones are pretty bad, I'm gonna be honest, but the ones on YouTube are honestly usually just people sharing their process, which can be very genuine and also help you out, especially if you're stuck on a really specific thing. I think it's more what consuming a bunch of them makes you feel like rather than the content itself, if that makes sense. Because in my experience, I always feel severe burnout if I watch too many tutorials at once, and after a while, I don't even know what I'm trying to fix, or I didn't know to begin with, and I forget how to draw organically. Which makes me realize that Pinterest art base addiction is definitely an honorable mention for this list. It's better to consume art tutorial content when there's something specific you're trying to learn or study, rather than if you're just bored and just want to change up your art but don't know specifically what you want to do. Because, in my opinion, it just has always made me hate my art more. Because suddenly I feel like I just have to change things that I didn't care about before and still don't really care about, but I just feel an obligation towards for the sake of, I don't know, really, you know what, I just think I'm deranged or delusional. <music> Making way too many freaking OCs. Now, I know, this isn't exclusively a digital artist thing. I get it. But I swear, making new OCs when you start digital art is so much easier and so much more appealing than traditional. All you gotta do is make a new canvas. You've got all these colors at your disposal. No searching for the right markers or making use of what you have. Art bases exist. You can look up all kinds of different themes and mood boards as you go. And we all had that phase where we made so many OCs out of nowhere. And some of them were decent, some of them were okay, but most of them? Most of them were literal abominations, which is why we probably only drew them once until we either deleted or lost the file or later on found that character again and started using them just for the pure nostalgia and not because they were a good design. I'd always tell myself I was making the next big OC story, but then I'd realize I needed more characters for small supporting roles. So I'd make them on impulse, but not that much thought would go into them. So they'd just kind of be boring and just like there, I guess. And I'd lose track of them all. Toy House was such a blessing for me to find and keep track of all my characters. But before I had that resource, I'd just save them to my gallery thinking I'd draw them a lot. So I'd never lose that image, but just immediately losing them because I didn't draw them a lot. I didn't. <music> Refusing to draw certain things ever. Hands, backgrounds, the other eye, the rest of the leg, whatever it was, maybe all of them. The things that we didn't really know how to draw yet and the skills that were significantly underdeveloped, so we just avoided using them and it showed. When we hid hands behind the back in a shy, oo pose, when in reality we just didn't want to draw the hands. When we covered half the face with the hair to be cool and emo, when in reality we just didn't want to draw half the face. I think this was probably before we knew how to or were motivated to do isolated studies. And don't get me wrong, I still don't like drawing backgrounds very much, so I only really draw them sparingly if I'm being paid to do so or if I just felt like drawing a scene or a background or if I sketched it on a page in my sketchbook just for fun. Picking and choosing when you want to draw specific things is okay. Of course, diversity is what makes you improve, but improve at your own pace. But honestly, that phase where you're still starting out and you don't really have a specialty anywhere, so anything tedious or requiring extra effort you just left out was definitely a fun one. It was just so obvious, even if we thought we were hiding it really well. 
So yeah, that's all for today, folks. I'm a little sick right now again. Yes, I know. I took the entire day off from school and I'm feeling better than I did this morning. I had a really bad headache this morning. I don't have that bad of a headache anymore. But if my voice sounds wonky or yucky or is cracking a lot, which I noticed while I was recording this, then that's unfortunately why. So I'm sorry about that. Hopefully next upload it won't be that way. I'm praying that I'll recover. Thank you for watching, and as always, I'll see you guys next time.